Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Would you stand as I read scripture this morning? Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's sing together.
as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory Good morning, First Baptist. It's great to be with you this morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the elders here and the lead pastor of the church. We're so grateful that you've chosen to come and worship with us, particularly if you are visiting this morning. Uh, you'll notice there's, we're not asking you to fill out a card to make your visit known to us. I would love, if you are visiting, for you to just more personally come down and say hello to me. I'd love to shake your hand and, and be able to look you in the eyes and tell you 
welcome on behalf of the membership here at First Baptist. Uh, so if you are visiting with us this morning, please uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, it's great to sing the word. We're going to pray the word. We're going to hear the word. We're going to see the word this morning in form of communion. And so it's a, a special morning for us here today as we worship. Uh, we want to let you know that if you are here and uh, you're a Christian uh, planning on participating in the Lord's Supper and you need a gluten-free option, uh, we've got you covered. If you just let the person who is distributing the elements uh, in your pew know that you need the gluten-free option, we'd be happy to get that to you this morning. We, we definitely don't want you to get sick at the Lord's Supper, so uh, don't feel any embarrassment to let the person know uh, who's coming down the aisle for your row. A few announcements as we continue in our worship this morning. Uh, first of all, this morning we began at 9 a.m. our summer adult growth group, uh, which we're calling Foundations. If you are looking for just a, a bit uh, more robust understanding of some of the key doctrines of the Christian faith, I'd encourage you to come into this room at 9 a.m. Uh, that class is being taught by a variety of our elders. I had the privilege of sitting in for at least half of it this morning before I had to leave, uh, and one of our elders, Adam Brooks, was talking about the clarity of Scripture, our ability because of God's uh, revelation to understand what He has said to us. It was an encouragement to my soul. I trust it would have been to yours as well. So you can join back up with that group next week. Uh, if you're free at 9 a.m., I would encourage you to do so. If you are a parent with a student in grades 7 through 12, uh, we want to let you know that there is a student ministry trip to Laurel Caverns, which will take place on Tuesday, June 13th. Uh, there's a $15 registration fee due by June 11th. If you have any questions, you can contact uh, Kendall Hunter, our student ministries pastor, uh, with any questions or concerns that you might have. This would be a great on-ramp for students who haven't yet gotten plugged into the youth group. So uh, if that describes you, I would encourage you to get in touch with Kendall. And then also, uh, sticking with the theme of our younger church family, uh, we do have VBS and sports camp taking place June 26th through the 30th, and if you're interested in bringing your children, you can sign up online or in the lobby. Uh, beyond that, we do need people to help out, and especially in the nursery. Uh, so if you are available those days to help out in the nursery, uh, we'd encourage you to let Christy Stewart, our children's director, know, and she'll get you onboarded uh, with great eagerness, I am sure. Finally, this morning, uh, we want to announce to you that the church has made a couple of hires uh, over the course of the past month or so. These are su uh, support staff hires at a part-time uh, level, but we are thrilled about both of them. So first of all, in terms of maintenance, we have brought on board Dan Flumer, uh, who has been doing a great job uh, already in his role as uh, a maintenance guy here at the church. So we want to welcome Dan. And then as well at the church administrator position, uh, you'll know that that was left vacant by the passing of Lloyd Lamb. Uh, we have brought on uh, the recently retired Rod McCormick to fill that position. Uh, so happy retirement to Rod. He gets to come here and work with us. And uh, I'm, I'm sure he, he, he'll probably determine he'd rather be golfing at some point, but we're glad to have Rod on board as well. So if you see either of those brothers uh, in the lobby or in the hallways after church, make sure you congratulate them on their new hire. Uh, we are thrilled to have them on the team. So having said all that, uh, we'll turn this morning to our morning scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. You may turn there if you'd like, or you may listen uh, just the same. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, where Isaiah prophesies the coming of a child uh, ultimately fulfilled in the birth of our Lord Jesus, a passage that we're familiar with, uh, especially as we read it so often around Christmas time. So hear the word of God from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah writes, Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. 
for you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. As we turn to prayer this morning, we're praying uh, for the family of Melba Baird upon her passing and seeking the Lord's favor upon our service together this morning. So let's bow and pray uh, as we continue in our worship. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your zeal, you have accomplished the fulfilling of the prophecy that we've just read. That your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who dwelled with you in eternity past, the one who was the word and was with God and was God, became flesh. And that we can point to the Lord Jesus as our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our eternal father and prince of peace. We pray that this morning in all that we say and all that we think and all that we do, that the Lord Jesus would be magnified. We pray that you would give us the attitude corporately that you gave John the Baptist, that we would be those who say Jesus must increase and we must decrease. We thank you for the privilege of church family this morning. As we think about Dan and Rod and the, the meaningful membership that those two brothers represent We thank you for them. We thank you for the way that they are so willing to use their gifts and talents here to glorify you. They could be doing so many other things at this stage of life, and yet they've chosen to serve you. And we as a church family just want to thank you for them and uh, and give you the glory uh, for them and pray that you would continue to use them to bless and encourage this church family so that we might be uh, a, a sounding board for the gospel in Lawrence County. Lord, we heard this morning, and we pray along with them that they would mourn as those who have a hope, a hope in the future resurrection, a hope in that glorious day that we've sung about already together this morning, that Jesus will return and he will resurrect all those who have trusted in him to eternal life and a new heaven and a new earth. That even as Melba has died as humans do, that she will live in the spirit even as Jesus does. She will be resurrected. And Lord, that's our hope this morning as we we think about Melba and her family. As we continue to think about uh, Cindy Welker upon the passing of her father, Ralph. Or as we think about all of these things, we pray that in the nitty gritty of life, even as we endure very difficult hardship that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and not to seek to interpret the things that happen in life apart from the gospel, but rather to apply the gospel to all that we experience. And so we thank you for the way that your word so clearly testifies to hope in the midst of suffering and the pain of loss. Lord, we pray for our service here this morning that as your word goes forth, As we hear your word, that it would penetrate our hearts and that we would be transformed. We pray that as we sing your word, that we would do so with joy from hearts that overflow with gospel confidence. And we pray that as we see the the word uh, depicted in the elements of the Lord's Supper, that our hearts would be encouraged to press on in faith in the Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, would you be with us in our time together? Would you glorify yourself? We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Why don't you stand? We're going to sing uh, a song entitled, I Will Trust My Savior, Jesus. And I just want to say, so often uh, as we come to worship at church, we expect to hear 
upbeat songs that describe the upbeat uh, rhythms of the Christian life. But this song begins with these lyrics, I will trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts befall. Trust him when to simply trust him seems the hardest thing of all. I want to give a word of encouragement to you if you are here this morning and it is hard to trust Jesus today. Maybe you're going through a health struggle or a battle with your own sin or maybe a relationship that is strained. And this morning it is difficult to conjure up the boldness to worship. I want you to, to think about Jesus on the cross. Uh, the, the, the chorus of the song says, oh, on that cross, how it was seen. I can go on ever trusting in the one who died for me. I want you as we sing together to think of Jesus on the cross and to renew your faith in him. Let's sing with bold assurance, even as we walk through dark times together. I will trust my savior, Jesus.
my heart be ever yours. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we'll be spending our time. We are continuing our series in 1 Peter. Uh, We've given it the title, Suffering Now, Glory Later. Uh, It's important to remind ourselves that in 1 Peter 5, Uh, Verse 12, he refers to this letter as an encouragement. So even as we think about suffering now and a glory that is deferred, uh, this is an actual uh, encouragement to us, not a discouragement. And that that should be kept in mind um, as we make our way through this series. Let me just give you kind of a, a portrait of the next couple of months by way of pulpit ministry, just so you're aware um, last week, uh, clearly I was, I was not here. Kendall preached and did a great job. Uh, that was a reading week for me for uh, a class, a seminar I'm taking in July. Uh, so I, I read all week and so grateful for Kendall uh, because I was able to do that. I'm actually going to do that again next week. So uh, Jeremy will be in the pulpit. I've got about a 600-page book to read. So if you could pray for me, uh, I, I'm, my intent is to finish it in a week and to remember it. So uh, please pray for me along those lines. And then in July, uh, there will be two weeks back to back where uh, Jeremy and Kendall will similarly fill in because in the the week that falls in between those two Sundays, I will be out of town in Kentucky. So I just want you to know when I'm not here, I'm still working hard. I'm still working hard for us as a church, Uh, not doing this to, you know, ask for a raise or go to another church. I'm doing this for us, uh, not for myself, but for us. And so just want you to to hear that and and know that. that I'm thinking of you as I I study, so please think of me as I do the same. So 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 1 through 6 will be our text this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Reading from the CSB, here's what Peter writes. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be, although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. Amen. Lord, we pray that as we uh, look to your word now that you would give us understanding and not just mental understanding, but a deep heart understanding of your word so that we might live differently in light of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in September of last year, the Pew Research Center released a report entitled Modeling the Future of Religion in America. And the the way that the data for this report was collected was that 15,000 participants were surveyed uh, with two questions. Question number one, in what religion were you raised? What religion were you raised? Question number two, what is your present religion, if any? So 15,000 participants, two questions. What religion were you raised in? What is your present religion now, if any? I want to read to you the results of this study that uh, the Pew Research Center outlines in this report. I'm going to quote it and make some comments as as I do. Uh, But here is what the report says, uh, broadly speaking. The center estimates that in 2020, 
about 64% of Americans, including children, were Christian. Now let's pause for a moment and consider the two questions, right? In what religion were you raised and what is your present religion now? The Pew Research Center is not sort of evaluating credible professions of faith as we would for church membership. So anyone who identifies as a Christian, uh, whether they are one or not, is included in that 64%. So that's helpful to keep in mind. Uh, about 64% of Americans, including children, were Christian. People who are religiously unaffiliated, sometimes called religious nuns, let me spell that for you, N-O-N-E. There's a very large difference between a religious N-O-N-E and a religious N-U-N. I'm sure you'll figure that out on your own. Sometimes called religious nuns accounted for 30% of the U.S. population, 30%. Adherents of all other religions, including Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists, totaled about 6%. Conclusion. Depending on whether religious switching, so people changing their religious affiliation the, the, from what they were raised in to what they presently practice, depending on whether religious switching continues at recent rates, speeds up or stops entirely, the projections, these are not predictions, they're projections, the projections show Christians of all ages shrinking from 64%, we've already kind of noted that's probably an inflated number, to between a little more than half, 54%, and just above one-third, 35%, of all Americans by 2070 in some of our lifetime. Over that same period, nuns would rise from the current 30% to somewhere between 34% and 52% of the U.S. population. Those are staggering statistics. And the question that I want to ask this morning as we approach the text of 1 Peter is, what are we to do with those numbers? There are a number of things that we could uh, really devise as a call to action for us as a church. I mean, certainly this argues for how necessary evangelism is, doesn't it? Furthermore, we could reasonably conclude from this how important youth ministry is and children's ministry is. We want our children not merely to be raised in the faith, but we want them to own the faith. And so it is a daunting task to be a children's director or a youth pastor in this cultural moment. But I'm not bringing up these statistics this morning for either of those purposes. The reason I'm bringing up these statistics is simply to say, Christian, welcome to exile. What is this strange place in which we live? This is a foreign land, and we must, as believers in Jesus Christ, those of us who trust in him, we must learn, as the psalmist says, to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. What will that look like? You know, one of the famous Puritan pastors said at one point that it is the responsibility of the pastor to prepare his people for death. But I think if we ask Peter what the purpose of a pastor is, at least as far as I read him, Peter would tell us that the purpose of pastors and elders is to prepare their people, God's people, for suffering. If those statistics teach us anything, beloved, it's, it's that 1 Peter is incredibly relevant. This is not speaking to some distant reality. This is where we live today. How do we live in light of our exile. Well, the text this morning has a pretty simple and straightforward point. It's front-loaded at the beginning of the text. But what Peter is telling us here in 1 Peter 4 is to prepare to suffer because Christ suffered and the one who suffers is finished with sin. Prepare to suffer because Christ suffered and the one who suffers has finished with sin. Now, there are three uh, main points in this passage that I want to walk through with you as we make our way through the text together. In, in verses 1 and 2, we, we see that we are to be armed with understanding. That's Peter's first point. Verses 1 and 2, be armed with understanding. Secondly, in verses 3 and 4, he tells us that we will be slandered by the Gentiles. That is to be assumed. And then finally, in verses 5 and 6, that in spite of all of this, we will be alive ultimately in the Spirit. So, 
Number one, armed with understanding, verses one and two. Let's look at those verses again, get them fresh in our mind and our hearts and understand what Peter is telling us. He says, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves, that's incredible language, arm yourselves, he says, also with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. Now, this text begins with the phrase, since Christ suffered in the flesh. Now, what Peter is doing, he's picking up on language that he's used previously. If you just allow your eyes to scan back to chapter 3 and verse 18, I want to read that verse to you. Uh, Here is where Peter is picking up his argument from. But in verse 18 of chapter 3, what does Peter say? Christ also suffered for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, in chapter 3, Peter is bringing forward the example of Jesus so that you and I might be willing to suffer as we speak for Jesus. In our current context, Peter again is bringing forward the example of Jesus so that we would be willing to suffer as we live for Jesus. So speaking for Jesus, living for Jesus, those two really can't be separated into nice and neat categories, but nevertheless, for the sake of understanding, that's kind of how these references are functioning. But I I just want to point out, I can't resist it, uh, in chapter 3, verse 18, uh, if you are here this morning and you aren't quite sure what Christianity is all about, I can't think of a better summary of the core of Christianity than 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. It is a glorious summary of the gospel message. This is what we as Christians believe. Here we have the death and resurrection of Christ, for Christ also suffered. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in the spirit. Jesus was crucified on the cross, raised in power. We have the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have the explanation of why Jesus died. You know, we do talk a lot as Christians about the death and resurrection of Jesus, but we have to get to why he died and rose again. And here in 1 Peter 3:18, we have that explanation. He died for sins the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus died as a substitute for all who would trust in him for eternal life. He died for my sin so that I might receive his righteousness. I get his record. He paid for mine. Here we have the purpose of this substitutionary death, that he might bring you to God so that you might know God as your friend and as your father. I want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian here this morning, to consider the truth of this verse and to come to Jesus today. Come tell me that you want to come to Jesus today, and we'll talk through that together. But this is the gospel. Jesus suffered in our place and gives us his righteousness. And here in chapter 4 and verse 1, Peter tells us, because Christ suffered, note the language, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. That is fascinating language. Arm yourself with understanding. Now there's, there's a way of sort of reading those words and going, okay, this is just, you know, another kind of rendition of the more you know, or that knowledge is power, etc. But that's not at all what Peter is doing. What I think Peter is doing, and let me give credit to one of my heroes, Tom Schreiner, what I think Peter is doing is he's, he's, He's encouraging us not to arm ourselves with knowledge so much as he's encouraging us to arm ourselves with a certain intent. There's an intentionality here described in the text. When Peter says, arm yourselves with the same understanding, what he's saying essentially is, determine for yourself to suffer on Jesus' behalf. Have that mentality, that intent Christian, this is, your, this is your loadout, if you'd like. That's military language. Arm yourself, right? Your loadout as you walk out of your house or you walk into your workplace or you go into the, the room where the rest of the PTO is meeting, wherever you might be, Peter tells us to arm ourselves, to be kitted out with the intent 
that my purpose for being here in exile is to suffer for Jesus. That's a hard word. But the reality is, is this is exactly what Jesus tells us to expect. Mark chapter 8, whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. See, I think sometimes we miss that in our evangelism and in our church discussion. To follow Jesus is to intend to suffer for Jesus day in and day out. That's part and parcel of what it means to suffer now in view of glory later. But I want you to also notice that not only does Peter encourage us to, to have this intent that I'm willing to suffer for Jesus, but he, he tells us to do that for two reasons. Number one, because Christ suffered for our sins. This is a right response to that information that Jesus suffered for our sins. The right response is to say, okay, well, I'm willing, to, in order to have Jesus, I'm willing to suffer on his account. I'm willing to bear his name. I'm willing to be slandered, as we'll see here in a moment. I'm willing to suffer if it means I get Jesus. And when we, we sort of think about what Peter's saying in those terms, it makes complete sense of the rest of these two verses. Have this intent. Be willing to suffer on Jesus' account. Verse 2, uh, or, or rather in, in the second half of verse 1, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. What is Peter saying? Peter is saying, you know you've gotten hold of a genuine Christian. Everyone listen. You know you've gotten hold of a genuine Christian when you find someone who's willing for, to suffer for Jesus. You know you've gotten hold of a genuine Christian when someone wants to be a Christian when it's hard, not when it's easy. You know you've gotten hold of a genuine Christian when someone can sing, I will trust my Savior Jesus, and not merely glorious day. There's a place for both. But what Peter is saying is the person who is willing to sign up to bear the name of Jesus and the reproach of culture as an exile in this world is not going to be quick to turn around and indulge in sin. Yeah, the person who is willing to suffer on account of Jesus is the person who has shown, demonstrated in their life, by their actions, by their willingness to suffer, that they truly have turned away from sin and turned to Christ. Peter is not here encouraging us to live perfect lives. What he is encouraging us to do is to live repentant lives, different lives, markedly different lives than the culture around us so that it might be demonstrable that we know and follow Christ. Armed with understanding, what does that mean? It means I enter into the Christian life fully aware and fully prepared for it to be hard. Is that you? Are you willing to be one of the 30%? The 25%? If you're in Scotland or France where some of our missionaries are, the 1%. Armed with understanding, this will be difficult. The one who is willing to suffer for Jesus has finished with sin. I love the picture of conversion here. Brothers and sisters, each and every one of us has a before and after photo. Do you know that? You better. Our lives look different now that we know Jesus, right? He changes us. And because of that, number two, we're slandered by the Gentiles. That's our second point. Now, I want you to understand, I, I know my tone is heavy. I, I'm not mad, I'm passionate. Okay, I don't think I'm mad at you. I'm not mad at you, I love you. I love you enough to tell the truth. Christianity's hard. Point number two, slandered by the Gentiles. That's where Peter goes, slandered by the Gentiles. Why? Why is it hard to follow Jesus? What can I expect if I sign up to follow Jesus? Let's say you're here this morning and 1 Peter 3.18 is beckoning you towards Christ. What can you expect? Verses three and four, here he grounds what he said about suffering. For there has already been enough time, he says, spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. 
carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. Nice list, isn't it? Nice list. So here, here's, here's Peter's logic. Understand this. If a willingness to suffer shows a break with sin, friend, listen, a break with sin will inevitably lead into further suffering. It can't, can't but do that. For there's already been enough time doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Now, we don't need to have carefully crafted or detailed definitions of all these vices. We've got children in here. You understand with stunning clarity what Peter is talking about. He's talking about a poisonous concoction of intoxication, sexual immorality, and idolatry. Isn't he? When you just read the verses again, you can see it. It's intoxication, drunkenness. I love how the ESV translates it, drinking parties. It is sexual immorality. It is idolatry. Peter says this is the world in which we live. This is what characterizes the Gentiles. Now, somebody says, you know, I, I don't think the Bible's very relevant. I don't think the Bible speaks to today. Have you been on a college campus lately? Have you been to a work party lately? This is so amazingly relevant. It feels as if it was written last week. Peter is telling us not to stand in judgment on those who participate in such behavior. I want you to notice that he actually assumes that some of us, some of us engaged in this. There has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Some of us find our before picture described here in this verse. So Peter is not encouraging us to stand in judgment on those around us who participate in this kind of behavior. Rather, like the bartender who looks at a man who has had too much to drink or a woman who's had too much to drink and says, I think you've had enough. Peter looks at us as followers of Jesus and he says, brothers and sisters, I think you've had enough. The time that, that you have spent in carrying on like this is over. It is time to live differently and this will cost you. I'm just going to put it like this. This has everything to do with worship. It has everything to do with worship. The, the, la the last um, thing in this vice list is lawless idolatry. Let me put it to you like this. What I worship determines how I behave. So when you thrust me into the office and I know that my coworkers, after a long hard day of work are going to go out and have a drink and I know that my supervisor is probably going to spend a little bit more time with that female employee than he ought to given the fact that they're both married this is not an imaginary situation. This was a situation I once found myself in. The pressure's on, isn't it? If I don't worship Jesus enough to be willing to suffer for him, to lose out on opportunities for him, I'll cave. If I worship my own uh, sort of perspective or, or reputation, if I worship my own advancement, if I worship my own career, if I worship my own rep in the county, whatever it might be, if I worship anything other than Jesus, I'm in. I'm in. Because what I worship determines how I behave, see? Peter wants us to worship Jesus in such a way that rather than going with the grain of the Gentiles, that we actually cut against the grain of our culture, not in a combative way, but in a way that stuns. You see that in verse 4? They are, the Gentiles are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living and they slander you. Now sometimes we think that suffering has to be physical for it to be real suffering for Jesus. But anyone who's been verbally slandered and assaulted for the sake of Jesus knows it's not fun. And that's the kind of suffering here that Peter is picturing. The suffering that comes on account of others slandering us, Gentiles slandering us for our commitment to godly living in Christ Jesus. 
They're surprised, he says, that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living. It's the imagery of jumping into a pool. And I love that because, like many of you, I spent Memorial Day weekend in a pool. And I think about Henry jumping in at 10 years old into a pool that was way too cold for anyone to have any business swimming in and then mocking me for not jumping in as well. And the line of argument that went from his grandparents was, well, don't you remember when you were 10 years old, you'd jump into any pool? And I said, but I was 10. I'm 42 now almost. I'm not jumping into a cold pool. Those days are beyond me. You get the picture. Why won't you jump into this pool with us? You used to. You used to come to this party. You used to go to that bar. You used to say those words. You used to go to those websites. Why don't you do it anymore? Well, I'm armed with understanding. And I'm willing to be slandered by the Gentiles. But finally, verses 5 and 6. Not merely uh, armed with understanding. Not merely slandered by the Gentiles. But fully and finally verses 5 and 6, alive in the Spirit. And we've had a lot of suffering now in this text, haven't we? There's a lot of suffering described here. We need a little bit of glory later. In verses 5 and 6, listen to what Peter says, they, that is the Gentiles, that slander us on account of Jesus, they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, Peter says, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. The Gentiles will give an account. Simply stated, there is an appearance before the ultimate judge that awaits every human being on the far side of life in this world. There is a judgment on the far side of death. And on that judgment day, Christians who are willing to bear the name of Jesus and suffer for his sake will be vindicated and the enemies of Jesus will be judged. God will visit his people with salvation and his enemies with justice. They will give an account. But I wonder if you caught a glimpse of what Peter says here. The gospel was also preached to those who are now dead. It's an interesting little phrase, seems to come out of nowhere. Until you consider the fact that in the first century, much of the sort of persecution against Christians, much of the question about the reality of the gospel would have gone along these lines. Why are you so concerned about avoiding our drunkenness and our immorality and our idolatry when you face the same judgment we face. Following Jesus doesn't do anything for you by way of death. Many of your fellow brothers and sisters have died. Perhaps you've heard something like that yourself. What good is it to follow Jesus if you will die just the same as I do? I think that's incredibly helpful as we think about this text. The gospel was also preached to those who are now dead. Peter is writing to a a group of people who are tempted to to believe due to the taunts of those around them that the gospel isn't true because their friends have died. So when you attend a funeral, a Christian funeral, how do you view what is taking place? Is it just a tragedy that we believe in Jesus for this life and then die like everyone else? Is it the response to that, at least from a worldly perspective, to eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die? Or is there something bigger at play? What Peter here says is that those who had died in Christ had the gospel proclaimed to them so that although they might be judged in the flesh, I like the ESV here, the way people are, death comes for all, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. In other words, though they die, they will rise again. That's the promise of the gospel. And it is a glorious promise. I want you to see that this is the promise that fuels our willingness to stand out and be different. Some of us uh, have have believed, I'm reading a a book with a group of middle-aged guys here in the church called Evangelism is Exiles, I've referenced it before, 
And in the book, Elliot Clark, the, the writer, says, you know, sometimes we think Christianity is going to be more attractive to people when we show that we're just like them. Brothers and sisters, that is exactly upside down. Christianity becomes attractive to people when they see how unlike them we actually are. Not because we're better, but because we've come to understand that there is hope on the far side of death, that there is life on the far side of death for those who have trusted in Jesus and his work in the gospel. Let me put this as, as uh, concretely as, I, as I, I think I can. Last week, I was in Ohio on Sunday morning, and I got to worship at Parkside Green, which I don't really know what the phrase home church means, but I guess that would be like my home church. This is my home church. You're my family. But, you know, the way people popularly use the phrase, it's my home church. My best friend's the pastor. I got to sit in, um, in the pew next to my niece and her husband, which is amazing. And hear God's word preached um, incidentally, Tim Kim, one of our uh, Geneva grads, he's not a member, but you'll, many of you will know Tim Kim, just got hired at Parkside Green as a middle school resident, so our bond with that church is going to increase. But nevertheless, I sat through the sermon, and the final hymn was It Is Well. You know the song, It Is Well. And I, I turned to my niece, and I said, Amanda, this was your grandpa's favorite hymn. was not because not because he's dead and gone never to live again but because he's got better hymns than have ever been written on this side of eternity he's alive and he'll come out of the tomb it was worth it to suffer for jesus sake Brothers and sisters, I cannot impress on you more passionately. Do not give in to the lies of this world that to have your best life now is really the purpose of living. No. There is an indescribably better life on the far side of death and a new heaven and a new earth with resurrected, glorified bodies. And when we've been there 10,000 years, to quote another of my heroes, bright shining as the sun, none of us, listen, none of us, will look at one another and say, you know, I really missed out on that corporate work party. Not one of us. Not one of us will say, I really should have indulged my sexual appetite more. Not one of us. We'll turn to the throne and say, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We will worship. There is glory on the far side of suffering. Are we willing to be the 35%, the 25%, the 15%? Those who have heard the gospel call say amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just so humbled by the truth of your word, so encouraged by how relevant and practical it feels, feels God, like you, you just inspired this yesterday. We're so grateful, some of us who see our former resume in verses, uh, in verse 3, but we hear the call of your grace that, that there's been enough time spent in doing that. Now we, we get to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be those who are um, unaware of the call to die to ourselves and to uh, live our lives now on this side of our conversion, no longer for our fleshly desires, but for the, the, the glory of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would help us in this place, in this county, to be willing to suffer for the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we, we don't want to make light of it. It's hard. It's scary. And so we pray that you would help us to arm ourselves, to, to be loaded out with this kind of understanding. I will bear the reproach of Jesus' name for Jesus' sake.
I will walk through suffering now for the promise of glory later. Lord, thank you for 1 Peter. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us, please? again.